So as promised, I'm here with Gavin Casey and we're recording in the Hulu Theatre in Madison Square Garden just after the weigh-in there, Gavin. Uh, we're doing a preview on the Katie Taylor Amanda Serrano fight tomorrow night. What did you make of that weigh-in? Very moving, actually, I thought, wasn't it? I, I was up close and I was lucky enough to sort of have a full view of the fighters and you could see what it meant to Katie especially, just to have so many people over here. It's been reported uh, plenty this week that they were expecting about 4,000, 4,500 people from Ireland and the UK. And I think she's very cognizant of the fact that to have so many people who are willing to spend their hard-earned cash to come over and watch you fight or watch you do anything really is um, quite a unique thing to experience, I'd say, from her point of view. So to see that finally manifest itself in so many people here and the noise that we heard in this arena, which actually felt like it was going to take the roof off at times, was pretty special. I've been at like a few very good weigh-ins over the years, but there was something really... I don't know, like crystallizing about that. It felt like that these two women have arrived and as a whole, their sport has arrived as well. Like this, you know, what more can you ask for in terms of acceptance and being embraced as uh, for female sports? So um, I really enjoyed it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, You could see the passion in their eyes. It was getting a bit close and it's don't, don't, don't to gritty now. Like it's only 24 hours to go. We could see here on one side, we had all the Puerto Rican fans. On this side, we had all the Irish fans, and when it was back and forth, it was like the rabble roses of the Irish on one side, the carnival atmosphere from the Puerto Ricans, I think tomorrow night is going to be absolutely electric. Yeah, it's going to be sick. I think the Puerto Rican, uh, whoever out of the Puerto Ricans brought the percussion instrument, played a blinder. That really added to the sense of occasion just before Serrano was coming on stage. There's somebody beating like, I don't want to call it a bongo because I'm not exactly sure what the name of it is, but some kind of percussion instrument anyway, and it really got them going. And the Irish sort of took it almost as a challenge then and came up, <laughs> responded with ole 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 and they probably outnumbered the Puerto Ricans maybe five to one in the arena so um, if that is a sign of what's to come tomorrow night it's going to be electric. I actually thought the stare down was quite interesting Mike and like I'm not massively into uh, analysing body language and all that kind of stuff but just saw it looking at Taylor like she refused to look away it was Serrano who broke the stare down if you like or just yeah. kind of got bored of it and even after she, Serrano had turned away and she started to pump up her own crowd like Taylor was still staring at her which was unusual because we never see her sort of partake in any of that sort of psychological battle beforehand so yeah I'd say it She's been saying, Katie has been all week, that it feels different, this one. And everything about it feels different, not just the attendance of the people here today, but little things like the stare down. I think it means, uh, this fight just means more to her than the rest of them. And when you hear her comparing it favorably to her London 2012 Olympic gold medal on NBC, for example, it probably is a testament to the magnitude of the event that it's become. Yeah, they were doing a stare down in, um, on top of the Empire State Building the other night and Serrano pulled away first, kind of laughing, sparking. It's, I know it's uncomfortable when you're doing it week in, week out and they're probably seeing each other all week, but Katie looked a bit more determined today, look, looked a bit more focused, whether we can read into that too much, we, that's I don't know. The thing. You, you, it, there's always a risk that you do read into too much and it might mean absolutely nothing, but what I just found intriguing about it is that Taylor would never really present a picture where you would be talking about it afterwards, you know what I mean? Yeah. She's always so neutral in those sorts of situations. I mean, people have said to me, like, she's actually really bad at stare downs because she is probably herself a little bit socially awkward even, and it is an intense thing to be going through and also sort of nonsensical if we're realistic about it. But no, this one, as you say, with the Empire State Building and that one there today, it just felt like she was really locked in and actually almost wanted to make a point to Serrano. And who could blame her? Like, Serrano for the last five, six years has been doing a lot of talking either herself or from her Twitter account which is run by her trainer manager Jordan Maldonado about Taylor about what she's going to do to her about her prospects of knocking her out about becoming the greatest women's fighter of all time etc and Taylor has for the most part not returned serve so I think she's been waiting like <clears throat> while she might not admit it to us uh, she's been waiting a really long time to actually probably put some manners on this woman yeah. and actually show her, no, you know what, like, all that talk was just talk. Now feel my fists. And tomorrow night, we'll see if she can make that point properly. Yeah, of course, we were at the Cindy Serrano fight a couple of years ago, Gavin. Well, uh, I think it was in Boston, it might have been. And it, so it was Cindy Serrano, of course, is Amanda's sister and who is married to Amanda's trainer. Yeah. And he was there was some um, trash talk going on that night and the Taylor Camp didn't say anything. And it's been back and forth since uh, I saw he was looming large over her during the stare-in as well. Or he, during the stare -in. Made, he definitely muttered a couple of things as well. I, I didn't catch them, obviously, in the noise, but... 
that was interesting all right i mean he's an imposing sort of a figure i still think him and ross enemy katie's trainer should be on the undercard or get it on some kind of <laughs> youtube show maybe a jake paul undercard down the line i'd re i'd watch the hell out of that but yeah, like there is no, as much as they've been very respectful this week, Mike, and they've really not really not said a bad word about each other. I'd say there's no love, love lost there as well. Like what people have to take into consideration is that Amanda Serrano has been professional since 2009. She would have been aware of Katie Taylor as an amateur, just as Katie Taylor was aware of her during her own amateur career. But when Taylor came into the pros in 2016, she entered with such fanfare and with such immediate media attention from Ireland, which sort of filtered into the UK, plus we had Matchroom and Eddie Hearn involved and Sky Sports, then by association. And Katie Taylor became like the name in women's professional boxing within a couple of years. Even at a more primitive stage of the sports development, she was still a name and Serrano wasn't. And I, th I don't think she took kindly to the fact that she had put in, as she saw it, years more groundwork in the professional game yeah. and had gotten a fraction of the return that Taylor had managed to get in two years. So for her as well, it's a crystallizing moment or, or a, uh, a culmination, if you like, in the sense that she's now getting paid seven figures, one million, 1.1 million, whatever it is. What's the breakdown in, uh, tomorrow night? Do you know what, what each fighter is getting? Uh, not specifically, but I know that it's both seven figures. Serrano probably just over a million, and I'd say Taylor close to twice that, or maybe 1.7, 1.8. I'd be guessing, but yeah. like roughly, I'd say that's that's the way it looks. So, and she's a bit uh, has a bit of a grievance because of that. The well, exactly. Like I mean, I, I'm not sure if she still does, but certainly for a while she did, and she, I would have said she made that clear. And she wasn't alone in that, by the way. A lot of the old school pros would have had a similar gripe with. Taylor especially, but some of the Olympians coming in from Rio and suddenly becoming almost, they weren't mainstream stars, but they were boxers, female boxers that people were talking about. And that was just never the case in, in their time in the pros. So what this is, is a, almost a cross-generational battle, even though there's only two years between the two fighters. It's an old school pro and Serrano against a new school pro and Taylor. And I would imagine there's actually a lot of old school pros like Serrano who want Serrano to win this fight because they would see this uh, influx of super talented boxers from the Olympics as almost um, potentially almost as an intrusion or uh, I th I'd say they're cognizant of the fact that it's better for the overall health of the sport. But like they were immediately surpassed by these women in terms yeah. of exposure, TV opportunities, interviews, all of these sorts of things, fight purses now as well. So. Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting kind of uh, old school versus new school showdown. So, so, so for boxers, and this did, did decided upon. There's like at a home, it seems to be like a natural progression. You go through the amateur ranks, and then maybe if you're good enough to go to pro, but do people go? Do boxers go into the pro ranks a bit sooner or over decided upon? Uh, they, they probably do because they don't have the same Olympic culture in America as they do in Ireland. Now Billy Walsh, who runs the American team now and trains them, has been trying to instill that culture in them over the last couple of years. It's also changed as well since pros have been able to re-enter the Olympics, which is absurd, obviously. But uh, Watch courses in Irish, man. Billy Walsh from Wexford, yeah, yeah. Uh, so he is the head coach of the USA and like he's tried to instill a lot of the ethos that he built with... Uh, with the Irish team, uh, with Gary Keegan and Zorantia in the USA setup now, and it's taken him a while to sort of build that. Um, actually, a sense of team is one of the big things he's big things he's focused on. And he found that when he was working with these like super talented young fighters, they didn't actually really have the Olympic dream that Katie Taylor had or that Paddy yeah. Barnes or Michael Conlon had. It was more about this is an excellent centre in which to train, and if I get to the, go to the Olympics, cool. But it was all about the pros. So that's shifting now, but definitely traditionally there's been more of a, uh, an onus or an emphasis on the pros among Americans and especially I would say with the women because in fairness women's boxing has only been in three Olympics so far so uh, they haven't always had the opportunity even to aspire to anything greater than just fighting for national titles or even local golden gloves so there's a lot of um, there's probably a disproportionate number of women who went directly into the pros particularly in America yeah. Uh, you spoke to Eddie Hearn during the week he was predicting a sellout all week so the, the, the garden the big room we're in we're in the small room here the Hulu the big room holds about 20,000. He was saying that there's 14,000 tickets sold. Do you expect a full house or close enough to capacity? Or? Uh, I'd be shocked if they sell it out purely because there seems to be so many tickets left still. But if you get 14, 15,000 in there, it's going to feel pretty full. I mean, yeah. if you got well, how many were here today? Probably yeah. 2,000, not even. Yeah. And it was pretty electrifying. So uh, I think, yeah, he mentioned up on stage that they reckon they'll get to 18,000, which, to be honest, is still some feat. Like, when you put into context how underground and unknown and not even forgotten about but very deliberately ignored women's professional boxing was as recently as 2016 
to be sitting here today for a weigh-in where you have people now they didn't pay to get in but yeah. they were applying for tickets to get in yeah. and taking time out of their Friday afternoons to cheer this on and then you have another 15, 16,000 added to the equation tomorrow night in less than six years it's phenomenal going and as you said at the top that little um, exchange between the Puerto Rican and Irish fans whet the appetite nicely for what's to come, I think, tomorrow. Now, 140 years, I think the garden has been open. This is the first time ever two female fighters will be competing in a comp competitive nature, headlining a, 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 a card. Like how, like, how big of a, an occasion, of a moment, of a glass ceiling shattering, to pardon the cliche, like, well, how, it, it's massive. It is, I think. The proof will be in the pudding when all is said and done on Sunday morning and you're thinking back on it, like the number of people here, the quality of the fight. These are two exceptional fighters, as we know now. I mean, if people are unfamiliar with Serrano, she is really good. Like I can. Let's I break can, it down. Like, let's, let's go with Serrano first, because a lot of Irish people might not be familiar with her. She's 33, mm -hmm. Puerto Rican, uh, based out of Brooklyn. Uh, she's she's done crossover. She's fought mixed martial arts and boxing. Yeah. Uh, she's got a stellar record. Uh, what are her? What are the dangers to Katie? What are her strengths? So first of all. She's a southpaw, which is always tricky. It's a bit of a cliche in and of itself, but they're just harder lefties to deal with. Her left hand is incredibly powerful as well, her back hand, so you've just got to be careful. She's going to check Katie's chin at some point, and it'll be interesting to see how it stands up. Now, I think Katie has a very good chin, but you still want to get clocked by Amanda Serrano yeah. more than three or four times in a fight, if even that. She has good boxing ability, nowhere near the ability of Taylor in terms of her actual technical acumen. But what we've probably seen from Taylor over the last couple of fights is that Either she is slowing down as a result of athletic decline at the age of 35 or, as she says, a calf injury had sort of inhibited her movement and a lot of her good work in both attack and defence in her last two fights, yeah. Uh, but in general, a lot of her good work is predicated upon being able to use her feet. So it's kind of... Katie's last two performances have almost been a bit of a leveller in the sense that two years ago, if you'd asked me who wins this fight, I would say Katie probably wins it eight rounds to two and, and comfortably. Now I'm almost leaning the other way, although the, the occasion has gotten to me a little yeah, bit here yeah. today and I'm nearly swinging back around to Taylor. But like, Serrano has also an excellent chin. As you mentioned, she's got that little bit of MMA background. Sorry, there's people hitting a, a punch bag behind us here, one of those machines. Uh, I, I need to see you on that in a minute. But uh, it's, she, uh, Serrano's so like very uh, strong in the clinch as well is a big thing. So like you mentioned the MMA background. She could very, very easily Clarissa Shields. It's Clarissa Shields. Getting back to Serrano, she she likes to go hit to the body as well, Gavin. Does she? Yeah, good, good to the body. She's actually, sorry, she's actually uh, just pretty fundamentally solid. I would say that um, Taylor has the advantage in speed. Serrano has the advantage in power. Taylor, if her legs are working, is probably better defensively. She can get her to dodge usually. Yep. Now, she's still a little bit reckless, whereas Serrano just doesn't move her head at all. Like, she should be eminently, eminently hittable. It's just that Taylor's last two opponents, I would have said, were actually pretty hittable as well, and she didn't hit them enough. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested to see how that works. Um, I think the Serrano does have a bit of a penchant for not gassing like she has a very good engine but her power does wane after four or five rounds I think she gets a bit excited at the start of a fight she looks for that highlight reel knockout uh, you know the type of thing you could share on social media yeah. and when she doesn't get it she sort of just loses a little bit of snap okay. now that means you can potentially take the sting out of her in those opening four rounds but the problem with that is you have to engage with her in order to do that and you're engaging with her at a time in the fight when she's at her most dangerous so it's a real balancing act like you can't just get on your bike and run around the ring away from her and expect her to tire. That'll actually tire you eventually, and then she would catch up with Taylor. So the first four rounds, I think, may decide the fight in so far as if Taylor can actually nick a couple of them, and if she can just frustrate Serrano, and if Serrano gets a little bit reckless, t Katie could take control of the fight then down the stretch when she's taken that that little bit of snap out of Serrano's work. So, I mean, it's a theory, but we'll <laughs> I have plenty of them, and I've been running through the running the fight through my head uh, hundreds of times over the last few months and it's gone probably a different way every time so and we were discussing the the, the odds that Katie was initially the favourite you were saying and it's after it's after switching completely you now Serrano is the odds on favourite to win tomorrow night um, so but the, the money is down on Serrano well there's value in backing Taylor now I would say uh, I think you can get her 
as far out as 11 to 8 or something like that. Yeah. So it's worth a look, I guess, if you're a, a betting person. But um, uh, I, yeah, I, I actually had some people who work in a bookmakers ask me how or why that it swung so much. Like, why have people putting been putting money on Serrano for so long? And it's the Irish that bet, not the, I don't think they have a betting <laughs> culture like the Puerto Rico. Uh, yeah, it's they a, might. It's a, they might. It's a strange one, to be honest. I think it's actually more so that the um, the more the fight has sort of, uh, I don't know, bubbled away and, and sort of entered the yeah. mainstream sporting news and the more people look into Serrano. Like, she was kind of a, still, I would say, to a lot of casual sports fans, she would have been an unknown entity when the fight was announced and that your instinct is Katie Taylor always wins yeah. but actually the more people look into her and the more people maybe look at Taylor's last couple of performances you kind of think okay this is closer than probably any other Taylor fight on paper and so close apparently that Taylor, uh, that Serrano rather is now the favourite which is the first time ever in Taylor's professional boxing career or her boxing career generally so 20 plus years and so Katie's she's a southpaw how difficult is that going to be for Katie has she faced many southpaws in her 20 professional fights I think she's, she's faced many in her amateur career she, I think two, I'm trying to think, was Nina Meinke, Southpaw, certainly Natasha Jonas was three fights ago, and Jonas gave her a tough night's work. Now, Taylor has faced so many Southpaws in, over the course of her entire boxing career that I don't think it's, uh, I don't think she's going to see anything in Serrano that's new. It's whether or not she's still fresh enough herself to deal with it as well as she tends to, or has tended to historically, because the Jonas fight was, you know, closer than I would have had it down on paper and Taylor had to dig deep in order to win that fight. Um, I don't think Taylor's especially susceptible to a lefty necessarily. They're just a little bit more uh, difficult to prepare for, for several re reasons, but one of which is that there aren't a huge number of women that you can actually spar that are good because the talent pool is still pretty shallow in what's ostensibly a new sport. So like she brought Amy Broadhurst over from... Ireland to work with her. Amy's a top class amateur and is a southpaw. She was working with Miles Casey, so you bring in usually a few male sparring partners. Miles, again, really good amateur. But um, that's maybe the only wrinkle is that like it's just tough to prepare for a southpaw or get enough southpaw sparring. But she's seen it and done it all before. Like I don't think she's going to be especially concerned by it. Um, it's just that, you know. There are sometimes uh, a couple of blind spots that a southpaw can find in an orthodox fighter. Yeah. And when Taylor defends the way she does, which is to say not well at times, the left hand is going to be there. So it's going to be checked, as I say, at some point. I often hear Ross in the, in the corner saying, get in, get out, get in and get out. But <laughs> she seems to like get in and she gets caught in the... She just seems to love staying yeah, in there. Yeah, like yeah. So. She hangs in the pocket sometimes, all right. Like, I mean, she's the first to admit she loves a tear-up. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if she can afford one tomorrow. I really yeah. don't know. I think, um, again, an issue with like uh, her possible inability to get out is just those calves, and maybe there was that injury, and it just inhibited her that little bit. Uh, we're going to find out tomorrow if it's fully healed, because like she is going to need to get out as soon as possible when she gets in. And if she has similar struggles as she did in her last two, like I think she's in trouble. So it's going to be... Uh, there's going to be a very delicate balance between attack and defence. It sounds like I'm stating the obvious, but like you've got to make the absolute most of your attacks when you're in there and when you're close enough to land. And then you've got to get the hell out of dodge because Amanda Serrano has brick fists. And do you see her any different tactics from Katie? Do you think it's going to be the same as always? No surprises. Um, I'd say against uh, Christina Leonardo too in Manchester in 2019, November 2019, she was a lot more cautious, like boxed really well, but got on her bike, was evasive, uh, didn't necessarily engage that much and just took a fairly comfortable points win. And I actually think that's the way she wins this fight, if she can. So I actually don't think it is going to be maybe the hell-raising spectacle that it's being built up to be. Like the event itself would be spectacular, but the fight itself, if I was in Taylor's corner, and, and bear in mind, I would defer to the people who actually are, but my sense of it would be that you box cautiously, uh, box sparingly as well, so that you don't tire later on, because Serrano is physically strong and does have a good engine. And maybe something similar to that Leonardo 2 performance, if it's possible, against Serrano gets the job done. Now, you don't know, but we'll be doing a follow-up podcast on Sunday, looking back on the fight, and we might discuss this further. But, <laughs> but this question for you is, um, what do you see happening, win, lose, or draw tomorrow night with Katie? Some people are saying she's, she's going to uh, retire. Do you see that happening at all? No, not at all. Win, lose, or draw, I don't see her retiring. 
I think for somebody like Katie Taylor, for whom boxing is three quarters of her life, there's an enormous void to be filled if you do decide to step away, and I don't think she's going to make that decision on a whim based on one result, uh, particularly when it's a, you know, it's such a difficult void to actually fill with other things. Like I think there's going to be a lot of planning needed in her life before she can step away from boxing. Even if I would personally say, "You win tomorrow, you've done it all," you know, what a time to bow out as well in front of twenty thousand. But you heard Eddie Hearn earlier mention the prospect of a homecoming, which yeah. is suddenly sort of on the table again, or at least the door is a, uh, a little bit ajar for that. So maybe that could top. Go back uh, home and fight in Ireland. In Ireland, yeah, maybe something in Dublin could top uh, MSG, but it'll yeah. take something special to do that, and it does feel like almost a, a nice moment to step away. Is I, the problem there uh, getting the right opponent in Dublin, or does it matter, or wherever in? Yeah, I, I wonder. I actually, I feel as though after this, and because it's been so long since she fought in Ireland, and because of what she's done in the intervening years, you could actually, she could fight one of us and probably sell out like, the three arena or somewhere like that you know um, at the same time something like a Serrano rematch in Dublin would be absolutely amazing you know if the fight is close enough tomorrow or whatever so uh, no I mean to answer your question she will box on I'm almost certain of that and I think whenever the time comes that she does probably or whenever the time comes that she should retire her team are going to have an awfully tough time actually making that case to her. Uh, I don't think they're going to want to have the conversation with her alone. I think it might, may need a, an American-style, sitcom-style intervention, <laughs> banners up in the living room. Yeah. Katie, we need to talk to you. She's like, my missus telling me not to play football anymore at 37. But, uh, Your legs are gone. <laughs> the legs well, just, yeah. As Ric Flair said, <laughs> I will never retire. <laughs> I cut you off there, you were, you were talking in your, in your mind about a minute ago before I, I switched gears to Dublin. Uh, I can't even remember what yeah. it was, so it's all good. And no. I think we're being cleared out here anyway. So. No problem. Gavin, thanks very much. Pleasure. Thanks. For a full fight report and an upcoming interview with WWE superstar Becky Lynch, follow us on Instagram, Facebook or Twitter at The Long Haul Podcast or log on to thelonghaulpodcast.com.